yes. Yeah, all, all necessary requirements are met. So I don't know if I can promise that um, I will speak more about uh, different modalities and about transformations. It might be the the other way around actually, but let's uh, let's 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 see how it how it develops. So so my topic is cultural data and semiotics transformations and uh, systems. Uh, so so to uh, give an overview of, of what I will. Uh, go through it. So firstly, myself um, uh, in, in connection to it. Uh, secondly, about uh, cultural data. Uh, what uh, What is actually cultural data? Uh, what are the problems in it? And thirdly, I'll, I'll talk about the connections of uh, semantics and data. How could, how could the data be understood in the context of semantics? And fourthly, the uh, transformations Mm, uh, which are basically we focus on one one study, uh, uh, which is actually pragmaticist, uh, which describes the transformations in data. Uh, but I will a little bit expand on it and um, <clears throat> mention also the systemic aspects that come into play and the fact that there is multimodality and that the uh, idea is that, well, you will find out soon enough what the idea is. Uh, so, firstly, uh, my, my background is actually uh, tied to semiotics, and, uh, but currently I'm, I'm a PhD student in, in Tallinn, in Cultural Studies, Tallinn University. Um, but I'm also um, a member of uh, Cultural Data Analytics or Kudan Research Group. And that, that explains my topic a bit, probably. Uh, so the, Cultural data and, and, and uh, analytics is uh, any uh, sort sort of um, field that tries to integrate a bit more computational approaches and humanities. It's multidisciplinary. So we have people who have arts backgrounds, uh, computer science, design skills. We have a linguist, uh, semiotic backgrounds, his, uh, who people who deal with history. Mm. And uh, of course, the big goal is to to get some collaboration going between different fields. And uh, so some of the main differences actually from digital humanities is, uh, for example, the, the digital humanities by, by Manovich, it's criticized to mo uh, focus most on text. And then this kind of more, uh, this kind of cultural data analysis, it should actually combine quantitative and qualitative methods. So you could argue whether it's analytics or analysis, analysis would be perhaps better use and uh, it would include uh, also the study of cultural complexity culture as a complex system but to begin with uh, so what is cultural data uh, data itself uh, so our social interactions have always left uh, traces so whether it's in the form of literary text architecture paintings or e even the effects of farming and landscapes mm. so with the digital era the previous uh, analog traces are being digitized. But uh, furthermore, all of the digital interaction has brought with it a great increase of such traces, uh, which count as cultural artifacts and uh, potential research materials. Such uh, uh, that this data is a representation, actually, uh, that the computer can read, transform, and analyze. Uh, and this data contains a finite set of objects and their features. And this data can be media, behaviors, interactions, as well as events, uh, but more on the plurality of data later. Uh, the increasing importance of uh, data uh, calls actually for research into two different directions. Uh, so firstly, how does data um, as such impact our society and how we, and we need a critical approach to it, uh, which is, uh, increasing uh, library research direction, of course. And secondly, how can we use this data in our research to better understand the societies using new research methods, etc. Uh, semantic perspective and semantic theories have been used to describe both of these. Persian model of uh, sign has, for example, proved to help uh, in describing the different transformations that take place in extracting and constructing data whilst the uh, Lotmanian semiotics has inspired approaches that focus on the study of complex systems. 
So I will mostly focus on the, the first one, uh, not that much on the complex systems, um, but I will share a few, few thoughts. So what's next? Uh, a short example of what can cultural data be. So cultural data is, for example, Google Ngrams. It is a uh, um, data set uh, or basically extracted features in a sense even from um, that is based on Google Books. Uh, Ngrams is uh, basically the, uh, connected to the frequencies in which a phrase um, or, a word, uh, or a word occurs. Um, occurs. And in this case, the frequency in which this phrase or word occurs in millions and millions of uh, books that are scanned by Google. So Google scanned this uh, humongous quantities of books that are curated. It's not all of the books in the world, although it's the biggest uh, accessible database in a sense of such. Um, and these uh, one grams in this sense are the frequencies of a certain one word. So for example, the word semiotics. So we can see the semiotics, the frequency that started to uh, grow suddenly after 1960s. And so it has continued. So two gram is like this uh, frequency of a phrase, for example, digital humanities that uh, gained popularity after, after 2000s, of course. And so it goes up to uh, five grams. But the, interacting with this data set uh, with ready-made tools allows us to see how these frequencies have changed. But this, this data has many limitations. And uh, this is just an introduction, in, introductory example I will return to later. Uh, because uh, you will understand more later why is this data problematic? And as well as the limiting affordances of uh, how do we uh, interact with this data. Um, so, the problems of uh, cultural data. Uh, the critical viewpoint is of utmost necessity, firstly, to combat the naive belief that technology can solve all of our social problems by, by itself. And uh, secondly, the lack of digital literacy in understanding how algorithms work. If, if a large part of the society is not aware of such uh, simplifications and transformations, that come with big data, or they, they don't believe in the, or, or they believe in the success story of technology, no matter what, then, then it leads to certain dangers for the society. So Meredith, Meredith Broussard, uh, a data journalist, uh, she offers a perspective uh, in the center of which is the term techno-chauvinism, uh, the idea that um, technology is always a solution. This is partly fueled by sort of um, sci-fi understanding of the tech also, and uh, also the cultural representations of human-like AI um, that have only strengthened such romanticizing idea of tech. And it has led to a misunderstanding of uh, artificial intelligence. So Brossard also makes it clear that um, what is known for anyone who is serious enough about uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, is that there is no human-like intelligence, we can be called, uh, and this human-like intelligence could be called general AI. But there is no such general AI, and AI is not like human brain. And there is only narrow AI, which means this is, these are human-built algorithms meant for specific tasks only. They're not meant to fully uh, mimic, uh, they're not meant to be humans. Mistaking this narrow with general AI, it is, uh, understandable with the famous Sarles, uh, John Sarles Chinese room example. So a person with no knowledge in Chinese uh, has to answer some questions written in Chinese, but no one sees him doing it. So he's given these questions and he gives these uh, answers in, and everyone thinks that he knows Chinese while he can actually be just using rule books, uh, which, uh, in which it is shown which uh, symbol corresponds to which answer. And in that case, the narrow AI is such a rule book making those uh, matches. But the more important part the, it leads to Brossard's main argument that algorithms are made by humans. They include human errors and biases. Data is socially constructed. And these problems with biases are becoming an acknowledged problem, but we need to be constantly aware of it when we deal with algorithms or databases. 
and uh, some serious problems, in, including uh, not noticing it, or uh, for example, racial racial biases, uh, and finding this kind of racial biases um, is is hard, and and we should not uh, blindly fall for data. That is the idea. But the, despite of it all, data is a very fruitful field to explore. So uh, what is data to semiotics actually? So um, whether data is, whether, whether we talk about born digital data or digitalized data, um, it does not bear one-to-one -one correspondence to reality. It means that data cannot be as complex as the reality because it is only a model of it. This implies certain transformations taking place uh, through the extraction of the data and interpretation of it. And data is, data is used to transform a cultural object into a model according, according to Compagno and Trelane. Uh, from this perspective, their perspective, uh, separating data from the cultural object is not always that simple because uh, both of these can be used to approach and interpret and understand the object. Mark, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, very quickly, uh, can you hit the presentation button on the um, right bottom, right side bottom yeah. of your uh, screen? It's not in presentation mode. Just so, because the slides are a little bit small. Okay, is that better? No, I think it's the same. There you go. Okay, yeah, that is better, yes. Okay, so I, I cannot improve it more, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay, yep, I will continue. Uh, from this pr semantic perspective then, the data is meaningful as a sign that uh, stands for something to someone, and of course in some, some capacity. And as, as they continue, they bring out that any quantitative analysis of the data, it would be an explanation. But because every, as every human, we have choices of interpretation, then every explanation is an explanation of a specific interpretation. So in, if we talk about quantification, we must not forget uh, the fact that uh, to reduce the complexity um, because of explanation, it might end up killing the meaning. And uh, we might not, uh, we might totally not understand the meaning of literature and art, uh, classic example. And it is because the what is observable and what are interpretable are in interwoven together. And uh, why semiotics and data together? And what does it give us? Uh, semiotics can firstly provide a critical understanding of data. But just as well, the digital tools uh, could greatly improve the scale in which semiotic analysis can be made and to observe otherwise unobservable phenomena. Uh, semiotics could both bring forth what makes sense in digital methods, as well as uh, use the tools to look for cultural regularities and patterns. And these uh, regularities and patterns are often um, hard to detect, except uh, on a large scale. And these new methods can uh, lead us not only to better understanding of the culture, but also the new perspectives into the theories themselves. And Compagno and Trelani bring the example of uh, repetition also. Uh, in large data sets, we can see lots of uh, repetition, uh, for example, cultural uh, memes, for example, the millions of different memes, and uh, to best approach the small differences that all of the memes have, uh, this sort of uh, computational approach might provide new new insights. And this is the repetition itself has become a logic of meaning production, according to them. Uh, another important aspect that I promise to come back to you is the quality of data, for example, Google Engram. So of course, the meaningfulness of the data in relation to what it represents, it depends on the quality of the corpus. Uh, an example of uh, Google Engram, so this is a really problematic corpus. It's been widely criticized because it lacks transparency. Uh, it is biased in many senses. For example, uh, famous, uh, most famously critical paper about it by Petschnik and others, 
uh, that it, it contains high amount of scientific text, with, which, which is actually not, uh, not clear. Uh, the problem is namely that we don't know exactly what are these biases. And also because uh, although we can find the count of the, uh, how frequent is the word semiotics or phrase cultural um, meaning making, let's say, but we cannot find the context of it because we cannot access the object. We just have the sort of metadata in this case. And interpreting the object through the data is complicated as the information about the object is easily distorted by these errors and misunderstandings we, we cannot easily check. And the same applies to the algorithms. Uh, as machine learning can find certain features that we look for, but the, the specific logic of how it chooses certain things, it is, it is still a black box. For example, the problem of uh, racial biases uh, in the data took serious journalistic work in, in order to be uncovered. To sum it up, uh, data is really clean and it is not a copy of what it represents. So the other aspects uh, of data. Um, so let's let's continue with um, this uh, one more one specific um, approach and this critical view from semiotics provides a deeper understanding of why data is not what it represents. So not only is data merely a model, but it is also the result of different transformations. So Khmer and others uh, offered a Persian um, model to provide a critical approach. They, they describe the cycle of data production and interpretation, the behavioral tracers of interaction uh, on digital platform is data in this case. So, for example, any uh, clicks on a website, the, what you, uh, let, for example, any information that this uh, search algorithms or advertisers, adver advertisers collect on you also. So these are these kind of data traces. And uh, creating this data involves decontextualization. And data in their perspective, it, it acts as a, Mm, a symbol more specifically term in the sense that for first terms they call attention to things while propositions they declare already facts or arguments give us rational connections of facts and therefore what is important is that these symbols they only call attention to the things that are recorded in the data they don't uh, make uh, they don't establish facts or make connections by themselves uh, to continue, after such uh, data is instead regarded as truly iconic sign. Mm, but it is an illusion of uh, taking something mediated as the reality. For example, what, uh, so what YouTube, uh, on, on their example, what YouTube recommends as the next song, mm, it is it's seen as the next song, but it is not, uh, uh, but it's actually just a possible song, what is recommended to you. So what happens is, coding, the illusion of iconicity constitutes a naturalizing process because data appear as unmediated, immediate presentations of the real, the reference of which does not appear to be needed to understand sign content anymore. So they turned attention to Umberto Eco, who stresses that iconic signs are meaningful only in cultural framework. It is important because we require, it means that we require this cultural framework, this cultural knowledge to most accurately interpret this data. And uh, this knowledge includes actually the knowledge of programming and other data management. If we understood uh, how this data came to be, then, then we will not uh, fall to this kind of, uh, let's call it naive iconism in this case. So this is where the digital literacy can help us to see through the apparent naturalness of data. So from composing data to mining the data, they, Premier and others describe this second part of this process. This is the mining data is the retrieval of, retrieval of data. So in order to make data communicable again, we, we need to recontextualize it. The recontextualization includes 
reintroducing referentiality and regarding data as indexical signs. But in order to make the data communicable, the symbolic meaning is reintroduced. This can be provided by human or through a computer algorithm. Even, but even if we're dealing with the machine learning algorithm that learns from a data set in order to carry out an action on our, another data set, uh, we, we, must, uh, we must bear in mind that what also Prosar reminded us that uh, there's always human behind the algorithm. There is, uh, I'm not claiming that, um, <clears throat> I'm not discussing basically purely machine-based meaning making in here. And uh, as such, there are many levels of meaning making uh, in data and they all affect the outcome. And all of this implies that data is not neutral because it relies on cultural agreement. And it is often mistaken as the object on which the data is based upon, but there are actually several transformations happening. So, but what kind of change is taking place in there and what, what sort of transformation it is uh, outside of pragmaticist terminology? Well, it, it is a promising area of future research. Uh, and uh, I doubt that the only transmutation uh, or any term close to the idea of adaptation would suit to be describe all of these transformations, but it should be part of the uh, understanding. So we need a more, it calls for more thorough investigation, of course, and we should also turn attention to the notion of modeling, for example. And from another perspective, Lev Manovich connects it to the concept of mapping. So depending on the field, mapping can uh, mean mapping between signifier and signified, or creating a correspondence between two different domains. But and also by cultural theoretical perspective, all, all cultural representations are in themselves uh, partially maps because they show only some aspects of the objects. And more, and the, the point, uh, let's say, that we're wake, making here is that there are different uh, data, there's a variety of different data. And so Manovich calls us to rethink these more traditional understandings of cultural representations um, to fit uh, cultural analytics. This field makes use of the huge data sets of text, images, but also videos, music, digital interactions. Uh, you can add there 3D spaces and, and much more. Mm, everything can, can be taken as data in some sense. He sees this, he, he Manovich sees these computational tools as capable of showing more in a big scale but not only because it also helps us to better understand the individuals. For example, understanding a painter better by comparing his paintings with other paintings from him, as well as his uh, contemporaries, um, to better understand his own different styles and how they fit in the larger scale. And different approaches can also have different sampling or um, avoid sampling altogether or distinguishing between discrete and continual data. And all of these differences entail different degrees of reductionism, and some encourage more than others a more qualitative approach. Perhaps one of the qualitatively most interesting approach is an exploratory data analysis. So for example, a three-dimensional space that depicts thousands of images uh, that we can explore and further analyze. And among other things, it can uh, help to perceive the dynamicity of categories, how they're not uh, um, uh, they, they can be crystallized, but we can make them dynamic again. And uh, it can be even help to, let's say, tweak it some settings that provide different perspectives. And to, to exemplify this different kind of data set and explore it, um, there is this uh, Google, uh, uh, Google has uh, developed this uh, Google Arts and Culture Experiments, and there's actually more applications they have um, developed. But this one is artworks mapped in by visual sim similarity with, with machine learning. So as it's mapped with machine learning, I'm, I'm not sure like what is the similarity exactly in there, but uh, le let's just explore it in a sense. So, um, so this is a 3D space, uh, which we can freely move around if this wouldn't be the picture. And this, in this um, 
3D space, we can so zoom in and uh, see specific specifically what uh, constitute these um, groups of images in there as, as it, it is grouped together by the um, uh, machine learning and and zoom in into the specific artworks and uh, this kind of tool is of exploratory data analysis it is quite different from google engram because google engram seems quite reductionistic uh, Com in comparison to it, as the words we extract from their context, they cannot even trace back to their context, actually. And uh, computational analysis, so it includes transforming words into numbers, right? But what is important is that these numbers, are, are these numbers transformed back into which kind of modality? So in this sense, these images are presented as images in the end. The visualization matters, the, the way the data is presented. And uh, also the, the way they're presented to us, it creates, um, um, they're in a new system. The data set itself uh, makes up a new system that has a, um, provides a new meaning. So we can see the landscape of this system in a way in here. And um, so this, this example of image exploration is rather different from Google Engrams. And, it is closer to what Manovich would call a remapping or the re rearrangement of the entities. And this re rearrangement, mm -hmm. uh, this rearrangement applies also to cultural phenomena as systems. So objects get um, recontextualized and they create new relations that have potential to generate new meanings in systems. And uh, there's also an approach to cultural data that mainly focuses on the changes of systems. And this is seen in, for example, John Hartley and Jason Potts reinterpretation of Lotman's semiosphere in what they call cultural science. So it is an externalist viewpoint uh, where in the sense that uh, ourselves and others, we were constituted through numerous external relations. So it, it means that uh, it does not only include social relations, but uh, they focus on social relations by describing the social groups called teams, similarly to what we think of as social semispheres. And so these kind of teams or social semispheres, they are the knowledge making systems that, that consists of people in a sense. Uh, these, are, these are complex systems where the sum of the parts is uh, uh, it's uh, where the sum of the parts is larger uh, than the whole in a sense. And uh, it is it is self-organizing system. And cultural science would study how this uh, knowledge is uh, translated between the themes and, uh, and namely translated, not transmitted between groups. And uh, also the object of study is how this results in new knowledge. This, this approach looks toward combining complexity science and cultural semiotics. Uh, this was a very, very short, short view into it. And uh, so, but also we could extend by, um, mm, for example, taking cultural memory. So we, it's a valid question to ask probably that could data be understood as a cultural memory as uh, data stores signs and that get recontextualized uh, based on the times and traditions. So data in good, that sense function as a cultural meaning making mechanism. So in, in the sense of this uh, images of data exploration, they help us to understand these artworks, these uh, artists, the, the culture as such. But in any case, the data is not meaningful by itself, but only by the for the interpreter. To get to the conclusion, data is a model. Uh, data is not a reality. And uh, it, it is a model that is always in danger of being mistaken with the reality. Semiotic perspective provides a useful criticism that can bring it out and explain the semiotic mechanisms of, uh, of how this uh, naturalization happens. And uh, some data is interpreted and semiotic approach to cultural data acknowledges the dangers of reductionism and that the semiotic 
is about interpretation or translation um, that involves an interpreter who is at least indirectly human. And data is not simple, uh, which is why it is fruitful area for future research. The further semiotic approaches to cultural data uh, could provide a more nuanced description of the transformations that take place with the data. Um, and of course, please note that there are several studies of semiotic approaches to data that I didn't cover and we, which could provide more insight and variety. And, um, some of them also from the same <clears throat> 2019 issue of Semiotica from which I took some examples from. And these um, further studies could include distinguishing um, differences uh, in data that are based on, for example, different types of data, such as different modalities and the ways of uh, uh, ways of representing these modalities, such as visualization and uh, different levels of meaning making, such as distinguishing between data and metadata. But to clarify it then. Uh, we could um, Google ngrams to in Google ngrams to Google Books itself is in a sense data and Google ngrams is the metadata based on it. So these are different levels in le different layers of meaning making. Um, and there's the cycle of data and there's the gathering of uh, gathering objects, transforming them into data, mining for uh, mining the data and um, and uh, interpreting it. And data is, of course, also a system in itself. And dealing with data it includes contextualization and decontextualization of this system. And uh, the object in this um, system, they, they, of course, change their meaning um, based on the relations. But uh, as, as a system, uh, the, we can discover certain patterns and rules, et cetera, that could describe this better. And there are a plurality of ways to approach this relatively new topic of research. Um, and uh, it could be done by different semiotic theories and, and different concepts. And the ones that I brought out were just few examples. So the idea is that there is, there is much to explore. And I will, I'm finishing with that. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you for uh, for for this really interesting presentation. Uh, yes, it's really nice. So uh, the now the sharing. Uh, yes.